Good morning, everyone, and welcome into Wake and Take. It's your boy, Jason, and we've got some football to talk about today. We've got some new stories to cover, but most of today's episode is going to be spent on yesterday's LSU Pro Day. Tons of stuff came out about it. Of course, that's going to happen when you've got the potential second quarterback off the board there, the potential second wide receiver off the board there, and, of course, another potential first-round prospect in Brian Thomas. So lots of guys to talk about from yesterday's Pro Day and a few fun news stories to break down. So go ahead, take out your coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome in, everyone. Glad to see you all this morning. Only streaming to YouTube and Twitter today. Facebook was we- being weird and totally forgot about the Instagram connection. Oh, well. Also, a couple minutes late. Your boy decided to go to Starbucks this morning. Did not make coffee last night. Totally forgot. And if you know me, if you've tuned in to Wake and Take Enough, I need iced coffee to survive. I don't know what it is. I, hot coffee doesn't do it for me. So I had to go get a cup of joe from the Starbucks down the road. And also, Scrap Iron, I see a good question from you. Good morning. How are the critters? Well... Well, Scrap Iron, how do I look on a green screen? That's kind of funny. Uh, Mr. Piff has decided to stay with me today. He uh, he is not in the other room. He is he he will be present for today's show unless unless he starts singing. But figured I'd give him a chance this morning. He was kind of hanging with me. Like I said, I had to go pick up a coffee. He was missing me already. We're back. We're ready to talk football. Good morning to you, Jamie. Let's talk before we get into the LSU Pro Day. I want to break down just a couple fun news stories for you, and we're going to start with. As we, as I told you, when this story first broke, when it first came out that Louis Rezamit was going to head into the NFL, I said, here on Wake and Take, we're going to make it a thing to cover it as much as possible, and he's going to be our little darling. And well, we have some fantastic news out of Louis Rezamit. How Louis, Louis, Lou, we're going to go with Louis. Louis Rezamit. He is signing with the Kansas City Chiefs, guys. How crazy is that? And not only is he signing with the Kansas City Chiefs, he is signing with the Kansas City Chiefs as a wide receiver running back, as a wide back, if you will, uh, which is very, very exciting stuff, especially when you uh, consider a rugby player who we'll talk about his pro day, actually had the international pro day, but he's six foot three and runs a four, four, 40, which is pretty massive. Also at 200 pounds, a rugby player. That's going to be really, really special for, I assume, the new kickoff rules. I think that this guy's coming to the Kansas city chiefs to be a kick return specialist and probably some sort of gadgety type player as a wide receiver running back positional designation would suggest. So I'm going to say this, unfortunately he is classified as a rookie. So you cannot pick him up on sleeper right now. I tried to do it this morning. Big time. Timmy Jim is in the chat. I was trying to offload Kenny Pickett to, to, to clear a roster space in our super flex trade gods league and because i wanted to pick up louis resamit and so it wouldn't let me do it it wouldn't let me drop kenny pickett for louis resamit uh just because i wanted to have some fun and also because i'm pissed off at kenny pickett tired of rostering him and ready to have some fun on my roster but unfortunately you will have to look for rookie drafts to draft this welsh rugby star uh and i i honestly I honestly don't know how this is going to go. I just think it's exciting to talk about. And I do think that the ceiling is at least there. Because let's talk about his pro day. We have the international uh, kind of player. What the What is that called? The Just the way that they're able to come into the league. The pathway, I believe, is the right word. Um, he They have the whole pro day and everything. So here's some information about his pro day. This is from an article. All eyes were on Reese Samet when he lined up to run the 40-yard dash. Everyone wanted to see how fast Reese Lightning could run under the pressure of stopwatches, but he only clocked a 4-5 on his his first try, and then improved to an official time of 4-4-3 on the second run. Reese Samet said afterward, I'm a bit disappointed in my 40. Last week, I was getting some really good times. I was running low 4-3s and high 4-2s, so it is what it is. It just happened today, but I know I can run that fast. I'm not trying to make excuses, but I know what I can do. Happy with how the day went. Just a bit disappointed in my 40 time. And then he talked a bit too about his route running. Uh, and this is also what the article said. Reese Samet is trying out as a running back wide receiver returner. He displayed good hands, was quick in and out of his routes. His raw, uh, he's very raw, but his potential is obvious. 
Uh, and he said, I'm pretty happy with how I ran my routes, just about how fluid I could be, how I could show off my change of direction, how I can get in and out of breaks. I think there are a lot of transferable skills in rugby. You're always trying to get your hands on the ball as much as awful, and you're always trying to break defenses, look for spaces, and be aware. I think I can catch kickoffs uh and a lot of other transferable stills i think a running back shows up probably best getting the ball in my hand early being able to pick a gap and being able to be aware of my surroundings so again uh this guy I, like i said i think he's just gonna be a total gadget player kick return guy but i think that that's gonna be very very fun and we know that the chiefs they are very offensive minded andy reed's a very smart coach i do think that he could put this guy in the right situation seeing a chief's landing spot for a rugby star with world-class speed and size. Sign me up, ladies and gentlemen. I'm throwing all my fifth-round rookie picks I can on this guy. I'm throwing fab at this guy if he's available, especially, especially if there is special team scoring like there is in the world-famous Trade Gods Invitational League. Um, yeah, very fun. Very fun stuff. I, I, I'm excited about this story. I really, really am. Uh, and another story I'm very excited about is J.K. Dobbins. We've talked about it. In fact, this is the exact landing spot I suggested uh, with the Ravens, of course, having Greg Roman, they brought in Gus Edwards. Now the Chargers are also bringing in J.K. Dobbins for a visit today. We know yesterday that J.K. Dobbins was fully cleared for football off of his Achilles injury. So he has recovered and now he's able to meet and test with teams and all that stuff. And his first one is with the Chargers, of course, his old coach, Greg Roman. This is fantastic news. He's going to sign with the Chargers. And him and Gus Edwards are going to be the Chargers' backfield. They are no longer drafting Blake Corum. They are no longer going running back in the draft. They're probably going to go offensive line, wide receiver. Uh, I would say offensive line first, honestly, is what we're kind of hearing from the Chargers. And then wide receiver in the second, third rounds, probably. But either way, if he signs with the Chargers, he's meeting with them today. I think he probably will end up getting an offer from them. I think he fits well in that offense. We've already seen him and Gus Edwards work well together. Uh, I like it. I like it a lot. And I, like I said, guys, I even we did a whole thing earlier this offseason. I uh, did a whole thing on some value running backs. And I said specifically on J.K. Dobbins, yeah, you might fail, crash and burn if you trade for this guy. But he still has world-class talent incredible skills that we have seen tons of flashes from just he hasn't been able to stay healthy and if he could just stay healthy or just give you some points even for a few games based on his value right now it's probably outperforming what you'd have to give up to acquire some jk dobbins so i think if you're sitting with like an antonio gibson or something right now like a backup running back that has a ceiling that people are attaching themselves to i would not mind offloading that player for a jk dobbins plus just to see what you can get, even if it's something small. And I also wouldn't, I wouldn't mind sending a, I would probably say a mid fourth round pick uh, is probably about where I'd put it for J.K. Dobbins. I don't think I'm in third land. I don't think I'm in early fourth land for him. But I think if you could, I mean, if you have to give a fourth, sure. But I do think that I wouldn't go as high as a third when it comes to trading for J.K. Dobbins. I would try to stay a little bit further away. I don't want to get burned too much. And again, I've talked about it a lot on this show. A Tons of people at Player Profiler have talked about it. Tons of people in the fantasy football space in general have talked about it. This running back class this year, ladies and gentlemen, is very deep. Again, there's no Brees Hall, although Jonathan Brooks might be a Brees Hall. We just don't know his health. Uh, there is a ton, and I mean a ton, of like Kendra Millers and uh, other random backup running backs that that have some ceiling and, and, and that that we can get pretty excited about with the right landing spot. So I wouldn't give a third for J.K. Dobbins, but a mid fourth or you know one of your other like kind of hand cuffy running backs, see if you could offload him for J.K. Dobbins. I'd do it. I'd do it. Jamie Progue asks Chargers draft Joe Alt sniping from the Titans. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I think that they should go Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze at five, but they have had an offensive line issue for a while. And Jim Harbaugh is coming out saying, you know, that offensive line is the most important position in football. And he's right. The exact quote, uh, which is just, it's such a good quote. It was, if you had to ask me what position can be good regardless of the other positions, but the other positions can't be good without it, then that's the offensive line. The offensive line is totally the backbone of every single team. And so for the Chargers, especially a new regime, going in with some kind of budgety players, probably not competing this point, um, then, you know, go ahead and draft an offensive lineman. I think Joe Wald is the good one. Uh, I like that a lot. Uh, Big time Timmy Jim says the Chargers could trade back with Minnesota, get a different OT. That's definitely possible. 
Uh, that's definitely possible too. I don't hate that at all. In fact, big time Timmy Jim. Maybe I have to do a new mock draft. Maybe I have to do a new mock draft. Uh, and to the house says, if they roster JK to this point, they probably believe in him too. This is definitely true. Uh, it's it's a, like we've talked about it with Justin Fields. It's kind of hard to acquire Justin Fields right now, even with the value dip. JK Dobbins, I do think is a little bit different now. I mean, I guess at this point it is a little bit more difficult now that he's actually cleared and visiting with teams. Uh, but I still think that you could get him for cheap. Like, I don't think anyone's still, you know, valuing him as a top 20 dynasty running back. Like he's found himself in the forties and fifties in these rankings. And I do think that especially team build, like say they have, like I bring up Antonio Gibson again, like say they have Ramondre Stevenson, maybe go give him an Antonio Gibson or say they have Derek Henry, maybe throw them a Keaton Mitchell, you know, like something like that, like uh, figure out the team build, figure out how you can scratch each other's backs. That's how you get these trades done. Another running back. We've got some running back news today. This one's quick. This one's quick. Yeah, I just, you know, you know me, guys. I've got to talk about Scorderell. He's signing with the Steelers, uh, and I'm excited about it, at least a little bit. Uh, two years, $6 million. So that shows that, you know, th that they kind of believe in him, at least, and that they don't think the tread has completely worn off, or else they would have only done a one-year deal. Uh, but either way, it's not like we can expect him to do too much for our fantasy football teams. He's probably going to eat into Jalen Warren and Najee Harris's production a little bit. But if you'll remember, even last season in Atlanta, Corderell really wasn't used that much. I know we were very, very upset with how that backfield was used, specifically B. John Robinson. But Cordero really didn't see the field too, too much, and he didn't get too much production. Uh, so I don't think that's really going to be the case with the Steelers. I think this is more of a depth piece signing, someone that Arthur Smith is familiar with, and someone who could just do, you know, whatever he's asked, come in for a few plays a game and make a little bit of an impact. But I don't think he's actually, you know, the Cordero of two, three seasons ago where he was actually a startable fantasy asset really, really eating into the backfield share. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think Najee Harris and Jalen Warren should remain relatively where they're at. Maybe they lose a couple touchdowns, and I mean like a total of two or three uh, over the course of the entire season. But I really don't think a ton is going to happen here. I just think it's a fun signing for football, and I like that Scorderell is still hanging around. Another player hanging around is Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds is signing a two-year deal with the Broncos. Two years, $14 million. This comes as they also re-signed Tim Patrick. So we were talking about Cortland Sutton, Josh Reynolds, Tim Patrick, Marvin Mims, a totally okay wide receiver core, but not the best one in the world. And there's definitely still some work to be done. Would not be surprised if the Broncos go quarterback and then wide receiver in their draft just to kind of fill it. But I do think at this point, I don't know if Cortland Sutton is moving on from this team, at least this year. I think we probably would have heard or seen something about that by now. And I think that this is kind of the core that they're going to go into this season. And I think that Josh Reynolds is like Tim Patrick, just a good football player who's going to make an impact in games, but not necessarily for our fantasy rosters. If anything, my big takeaway here is Marvin Mims is still insulated in terms of being able to take a good step forward next year. And Detroit Lions wide receivers. I think that we now know what's going on there. It's Amon Ross St. Brown. It's Sam Laporta. It's Jamison Williams. I think that Josh Reynolds was eating into a lot of targets last season for some of these players. With those gone, this was one of Jared Goff's just favorite targets. He's gone now. So I think that that does help out Jamison Williams in particular. But also like Sam Laporta should get a few more targets. And I'm actually not sure. I guess I can Google that real quick. Did Khalif Raymond... Resign with the Lions too. I know he was scheduled to be a free agent. Uh, yes, he did. He did. Uh, so yeah, he he's still under one more year with the Lions. So uh, you know, he'll be there getting some stuff as well. And Jared Goff looks his way as well. Uh, but either way, I think Josh Reynolds opens up the field a bit more for a JMO to actually be successful. So of course, I'm gonna pound the drum for more Jamison Williams. Scrap Iron also makes a good point about Cordero Patterson, uh, kick returner for the new rules. That's definitely a good point as well. I think that that is actually probably the reason there as well. Good kick returner for the Falcons with Arthur Smith. Probably going to be a kick returner there for the Steelers. Which brings me to the final news point before we talk about the LSU Pro Day. The Carolina Panthers. Uh, we already kind of knew this, right? But we just have an actual quote from Dave Canales. Uh, how is the RB1 in Carolina going to be decided? He was asked. He said competition. Let's see who wants it the most, right? Let's see who's hungry, runs angry, and that's the person that'll get the ball the most. So non-answer, but I think we all know who wants it more, who runs harder, uh, who runs angrier, who's hungrier, and that is Chuba Hubbard. Now, I do still kind of contend that Miles Sanders might be a good kind of uh, – 
uh, arbitrage opportunity here in fantasy football. Uh, everyone is off of Miles Sanders, but he's still going to be on the team next year uh, and probably still going to score some touchdowns on an offense that is projected to take a step forward using the quotes around projected for a reason. Uh, not sure how much I believe into it right now. I still want to see another wide receiver added to that team, but they're making the right moves. I think that Chuba Hubbard is, of course, going to end up being the starter, but I still think that Miles Sanders is an interesting one. And I wouldn't, ah, I don't know. I kind of like what Cody said on Mind of Mansion yesterday that the Panthers might take a shot at running back just because Raheem Blackshear is not cutting it. And Miles Sanders is probably going to be a free agent after this year because they can release him. So they do need another option there. So it's possible. Uh, but either way, I, I wouldn't mind going into this backfield. Chuba's is kind of cheap, and Miles Sanders is impossibly cheap to acquire. Like, I can't believe, really. And I've never been a Miles Sanders guy. And I mean, never, never. I've never liked Miles Sanders, not even a little bit. But, I mean, he's like RB65 right now. Injuries happen, especially at the running back position. I, I hate to say it. I really do hate to say it. But there are definitely some worse investments that you could be making out there. And worst comes to worst, you could just drop Miles Sanders, right? Like, it's not that big of a deal. Anyway, that is all the news I have for you guys, of course, except for the LSU Pro Day. This was some big stuff uh, last, or yesterday. Big, big stuff came out. Uh, I do want to go ahead and address, before we get into this, there's been a clip going around that Malik Neighbors' 40 time is not as good as suggested. Some guy did a laser timing on it and said it was actually 4-5-3 instead of a 4-3-5. Uh, and yes, if you do the laser timing, that is probably accurate. Uh, although, you know, it, things can be doctored, things don't look quite right, and it was a dude with like 100 followers on Twitter. But nonetheless, it's gone viral. Tons of people are talking about it. The thing that we all know, we all know this, the Pro Day 40 times are not super uh like you can't buy into them a ton like they, they are hand timed there's room for error we all know that and that's why here at player profiler and a ton of other places we actually add time to the unofficial pro day times because they're not official times we actually add i believe it's 0 0.05 seconds at least i think it might actually be 0 0.08 if i'm not mistaken to a 40 time to make it actually the actual like official to be expected time so with that being said, Malik Neighbors like 435. It'll probably hit most systems as a 44 to 445, uh, which is still a really, really good 40. It's just not necessarily as fast as some are saying. Um, let's see. Uh no, I did not see this, Jamie. Sorry, that, that that distracted me. We'll come to that at the end of the show. Got distracted. Let's talk about this LSU Pro Day, and then we'll talk about what you talked about, Jamie. Uh, but either way, uh let's talk about this 40 time. Let's talk about this pro day. Don't fall for that random Twitter video. It's gonna. It's it's more like a four four. Just give like basically when we have something coming out saying it's a four three five and another thing coming out saying it's a four five three. Why don't we just agree it's like a four four two and just and just move on and say okay yeah he's still a world class athlete. It's not that big of a deal. Forty times barely mean anything anyway. Cool. Glad we all agree. Let's talk about Jaden Daniels because this is an interesting one. Now I actually I, I didn't watch the pro day. I'm not there. I'm here in Atlanta. Uh, but this is what we can learn. And I actually just went to NFL.com for this just because, you know, that's an unbiased source. And that's where I like to get my NFL news from. Just go to NFL.com. Not trying to go, not trying to make this difficult. And they wrote a whole article on the pro day. I highly recommend checking it out. Very reasonable article. Very good stuff from it. But I've got the highlights. There were four big points, they said, from the LSU pro day. The first one was that Jaden Daniels had a solid workout. The other team, or the other one, lots of teams were there. Uh, which is we'll talk about uh, Malik neighbors measurables were really, really good. And don't forget about Brian Thomas. Those are the four takeaways there. Not that anyone was forgetting about Brian Thomas, but I do feel that, you know, still the market is a bit trepid when it comes to Brian Thomas, despite the world-class world class athleticism. So let's talk about the Jaden Daniels solid workout. And we put quotes around solid because that is what Bucky Brooks said about it. Uh, I can't, this is what he said. I can't say that it's been an A-plus workout, but it's been solid. We've seen the ball hit the ground a few times, but if you liked Jaden Daniels coming in, there's nothing that has taken place today that would discourage you from not, or that would discourage you from him. If you have concerns about his frame and his durability based on what he looked like at LSU, you're still going to have those concerns because he only weighed in at 210 pounds. It's really a matter of being able to imagine what he could be at his best, and can you build an offense around him that would allow him to play to his strengths while also allowing the team to stick to an identity on offense? 
So uh, basically what he's saying is that it was a good workout, uh, but you know, not the best workout, didn't really do anything to help his draft stock and all the concerns that were there for Jada Daniels are still there. And here's how he actually performed. He worked out with his private QB coach, Taylor Kelly, uh, and he threw the ball 56 times, completing 52 of those passes. All of the four of those incompletions were slightly off target throws on deeper passes and throws outside the numbers. He appeared to get better as the session went on and hit neighbors on a go ball for the final pass. Uh, so basically, he just struggles a little bit deep pass and outside the numbers. But that's also going to happen just, you know, when you're kind of warming up, especially in gym shorts, like things are just a little bit different. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but either way, the big takeaway from Jaden Daniels session is that it was good enough. There should be no reason to get upset at Jaden Daniels and also no reason to just go over your skis about him either. Uh, so just, you know, Jaden Daniels is what he is and nothing changed. Ryan Volt says there's a weird picture of his elbow going around. Let me actually pull that up, guys, so I could show you. I have been seeing this, uh, but I, it looks doctored because I was trying to look at other pictures of his elbows, and this is the only one that I see that issue in. So I'm not sure if it's actually real. But either way, let's just show it because it is kind of crazy. Uh, here we go. Let me share my screen. I pulled it up. And sorry for whatever else is showing on Google. It looks like nothing, actually. It's just pictures of his elbow. Oop, hold on. I'm blocking it. Check this out, though. You see it? It's like his his right arm, his forearm is like skinnier than the rest of his arm. And it's like elbow juts out a bit. Um, so I don't know. I don't see it in any other pictures, though, as you can see. Like, here's this picture. I, well, you could kind of see a little bit of a bulge. And on this one, again, kind of a little bit. But this one in particular is like way more prominent than I've seen in any other pictures of Jada Daniels' elbow. Like, like, look at this one. Like, his elbow looks perfectly normal. So I don't, I don't know. This one, he looks a little weird. Like, it looks like there's something going on in his elbow. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but it obviously didn't stop him in college, right? Like, he still just won the Heisman and threw for a ridiculous amount of yards and touchdowns. So I'm not going to get too concerned about his his weird elbow thing. Yeah. But, hey, we'll address it here on Wake and Take. At least say, hey, don't get, don't get that concerned about it. So anyway, I mentioned that a bunch of teams visited as well. Here were the six head coaches. So I think that this is more important. Seeing head coaches there, obviously, that means that they're very, very interested in some of the players there. Gerard Mayo from the Patriots, of course, probably looking at Jaden Daniels, but maybe not, uh, as we'll talk about a little later. Uh, the Giants, Brian Dable, of course. The Raiders, Antonio Pierce, probably for Jaden Daniels. The Bears, Matt Eberflus, also maybe there for Jaden Daniels, but potentially hoping that Neighbors or Brian Thomas can slip to them a bit. The Saints, Dennis Allen, you know, they're in the wide receiver market, potentially a Brian Thomas stuff. And Commanders, Dan Quinn, that's definitely for Jaden Daniels. After the pro day, Jaden Daniels was slated to spend time with the Patriots, Commanders, Giants, Vikings, Broncos, and Raiders. Also, Malik Neighbors had dinner with the Giants this week and later or yesterday met with the Patriots, Titans, Jets, and Jaguars. Uh, so all really interesting teams that Neighbors and Jaden Daniels has met with. But I want to touch on the Patriots for a second just because, again, guys, I don't think it's necessarily set in stone that they go quarterback here. If they're still meeting with the Malik neighbors and, and reportedly still interested in Marvin Harrison Jr. trying to meet with him as well, then I, I, you know, seeing that they're interested in these top tier wide receivers is signaling something to me. I really think that that is the best decision for the Patriots to get a franchise wide receiver and then get a quarterback. Just do what the Falcons have done, essentially, just build the team around the quarterback and then bring in the quarterback. But I just think it would be a disservice to whatever quarterback they bring in right now. They are not ready. They are just not ready. Very cool to see the Patriots meeting with neighbors. And, of course, the rest of the coaches meeting with these people kind of expected stuff. Vikings, Broncos, Raiders, I mean, the Commanders. Like, yeah, we kind of already knew that already. So let's talk about Malik Neighbors' measurables. Is he had a very good day uh, and basically measured as Jamar Chase, like literally. Uh, six foot, 199 pounds, 31-inch arms, almost 10-inch hands, uh, which is really, really good. And then he had a 42-inch vertical which was the fifth best at the combine uh, among all positions. So that's really awesome. And then also a 10 foot, nine inch broad jump, which would have been the sixth best at the combine among wide receivers. Now, of course, we mentioned at the top of this discussion, his 40 times, he ran an unofficial 4-3-5 and unofficial 4-4. He tweeted out after that it was supposed to be a 4-2-8, which I, I, 
I don't understand how you even think that if you have two things saying not that. Uh, but either way, that's how he felt. So he thinks he's really fast. And what we know is that he is really fast and that he's a really good athlete. And so, again, I'm just not reading into this 40 time at all. It's unofficial. comes from the pro day. We'll see how it goes. Um, but either way, quick guy, good athlete. That's all you need to know. All the measurables are really, really good. Again, fifth best vertical jump among all positions at the combine. Sixth best broad jump among all wide receivers at the combine. Six foot, 200 pounds, the prototypical size with good hands, with good sized arms. That's exactly what you want to see on a wide receiver, especially knowing that he did a good job connecting with Jaden Daniels, running some good routes throughout the day as well. So Malik Neighbors doing everything he can to keep his hype high. He even came out after and said he's the best wide receiver in the draft, said he should go over Marvin Harrison Jr. So we'll see how it goes. I still think Marvin Harrison Jr. gets picked first, but I mean, now Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors actually have some measurables that some NFL teams can attach themselves to to get even more excited about a prospect, whereas Marvin Harrison Jr. decided to sit out for all these things. Uh, and we'll see how that affects him. Very curious to watch this draft unfold. This is going to be a fun one. It really, really is. And finally, they said, don't forget about Brian Thomas on NFL.com. This is what Bucky Brooks said about Brian Thomas. He's about as naturally talented as you can find at the position. Big, fast, physical, runs great routes, natural catcher, does a really good job of watching the ball into his hands. He can shine. So guys, I'm just telling you right now, I think Brian Thomas is a really, really good value in these drafts. I know. I know that a lot of people are scared and think he's landing spot dependent, but I'm really starting to think that's not the case. And if anything, this might be a hot take here, but I might, I might start to feel a little bit more worried about Jaden Daniels because if he has two wide receivers this good that he's throwing the ball to and it, take him, and it took him until last year to actually have good college stats, I think that that's a slight red flag. I really, really do. So um, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be more excited about neighbors and Brian Thomas than I am Jaden Daniels right now. I want to see how things unfold. I do still, of course, think that Jaden Daniels is a good player. He obviously showed it on the field last year, but we have to ask the question like we do in the NFL, how much of a quarterback success comes from good wide receivers and to see two world-class first round pick wide receivers, potentially top like both 15 wide receiver caliber players, uh, that raises a slight red flag to me when it comes to quarterback, especially since his day at the pro day was just, you know, solid uh, per Bucky Brooks, whereas he says like uh, kind of kind of salivates over Brian Thomas almost. So <laughs> anyway, that's kind of what you need to know about the pro day. Don't forget about Brian Thomas. Malik Neighbors is a stud and Jaden Daniels looked all right. He had a good day, but not a great day. And that, you know, whatever. So that is everything I have for you guys. Let's go ahead and check the chat for some questions. Let's see. Do, do, do. Okay, yeah. So Jamie said something about fantasy receipts. Get mad about Pat Fitzmore, some player profiler. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But he's definitely not a lazy analyst, as fantasy receipts said. Pat does a great job, especially with our fantasy intelligence network. And he wins a ton of money every single year. So I'm really not sure how you could call a successful fantasy football player lazy but that's just what fantasy receipts does they're lazy all they do is save and bookmark posts and then just look through them later people are wrong sometimes i'm sure they've had a bazillion wrong takes as well so i you know i kind of hate what they do but it also you know the accountability is also nice too at the at, at the same time so either way uh that's that's that i guess fantasy receipts doing their thing we don't have to give them too much airtime here and then uh, Big Star Timmy Jim says, nice trade last night in the Trade Gods League. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, pretty excited about my trade. Made a little win now move. Traded Jameer Gibbs and Keenan Allen for Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, Tyreek Hill. Uh, and we did like a third round pick swap and got like Mike Williams thrown in there as well because why not? But big win now move. Moved on from Jameer Gibbs after all, ladies and gentlemen. I know that's been a story building here. Will I trade Jameer Gibbs? I did it. And I got some win now pieces. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I needed it. I needed it. My team was get, was looking rough, and I finally at least sort of fixed my quarterback room. Hopefully Matthew Stafford can stay healthy, uh, and hopefully Cooper Cup bounces back. But either way, fun trade. Thank you, and enjoy my first-round pick. That means nothing to you. <laughs> now, you, you know, enjoy the second-round pick, essentially. <laughs> uh, but either way, guys, that is everything I have for you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a fun episode of Wake and Take. And you guys were a great audience, as always. Make sure before you head out to hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe to Player Profiler if you haven't. So that way you can be ready when we go live tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern on the Player Profiler YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. 
Twitter. I have a special guest lined up tomorrow, Cam Edgecomb, heading the Player Profiler newsletter. So make sure you tune into that. We've got a good episode lined up. Uh, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Y'all have a terrific Thursday and a wonderful rest of your week. Peace. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.